Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, six Euro Control Stakeholder Forum on how we build back better European aviation post-COVID, which is being streamed live today on LinkedIn and YouTube. My name is Philip Hughes. I'm Head of Stakeholder Management at Eurocontrol and today we want to look at the issue of sustainability again and in particular the whole role in relation to um, hydrogen and what role it might play in a greener future for aviation. So modern planes use kerosene as fuel releasing harmful carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But what if planes could use alternative energy sources for aircraft that didn't produce any harmful emissions? Hydrogen is one of the most promising solutions. Aircraft using hydrogen, which could enter the market as soon as 2035, recent research suggests, would only emit water. And initial tests suggest they would be just as fast as traditional aircraft, carrying more than 100 passengers per flight over 1,000 kilometres. So while there are significant challenges to overcome, hydrogen is an important part of our solution to meet the 2050 climate neutrality goal of the European Green Deal, which the European Commission underlined when it adopted its EU hydrogen strategy in 2020. The aim of the strategy is to decarbonize hydrogen production using mainly wind solar energy to expand its use in sectors where it can replace fossil fuels. So the European aircraft manufacturer Airbus has pledged to introduce its first zero emission commercial plane by 2035. Branded as zero E aircraft, the aircraft will use hydrogen as their main power source. The Clean Sky 2 joint undertaking, a public private partnership between the European Commission and the European aeronautics industry produced last year together with fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking, an independent study on hydrogen potential for use in aviation. The study found that hydrogen could play a central role in the future mix of aircraft and propulsion technologies capable of reducing the global warming effects of flying by between 50 and 90 percent. Group ADP, uh, Paris Airports Group, has recently teamed up with Airbus, Air France KLM and the Paris region to build a unique ecosystem in order to prepare the introduction of hydrogen aircraft in 2035 a project that envisages transforming Parisian airports into hydrogen hubs. So our webinar will dive into this complex matter and explore the following questions. So hydrogen powered aircraft, can we turn the dream into reality? Is it realistic to expect hydrogen powered aircraft by 2035? What are the financial, technical, operational, logistical challenges that need to be addressed? What's the potential in terms of environmental efficiencies? Um, Will the new airframe designs require new, new airport infrastructure? So our panelists today um, are, uh, first of all, Ron Van Manen of the Head of the Strategic Development in the Clean Sky Joint Undertaking, Glenn Llewellyn of the VP uh, Emissions Technology Airbus, and Emilia Lumeau, Director of Environment Group Aeroport de Paris ADP. So, uh, I'm going to invite each of the panelists to give a brief presentation on their overview of the questions which we've raised here in this seminar. So without any further ado, I'd first of all like to invite Ron to give us a, a five minute presentation on the Clean Sky JU perspective on this issue. Ron. Good afternoon once again, and let me start by thanking you profusely, uh, personally, but on behalf of Clean Sky 2 for this opportunity. I think this is a great series and a, uh, a very timely moment to, uh, to address this topic as well. First of all, I think we know we have a problem, and if we're not part of the solution, we will increasingly be a, uh, a problem in the eyes of society, in the eyes of the regulators, and in the, in the eyes of the public. Uh, in terms of emissions. Aviation emissions, while aircraft efficiency has grown uh, tremendously, depending on how you measure and whether you measure from the 50s or the 60s by 80 up to even 90 percent, we all know that the air transport system has grown uh, to an even greater extent. And I think one of the things we've seen, one of the, one of the rather strange things we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic is that the general public's appreciation of what's called exponential growth has grown exponentially. Uh, we know we see here, of course, 5% system growth and roughly 1% to 2% efficiency gains in aviation over the past decades. Uh, and we need to break that trend. And we want to break that trend without breaking the growth, without breaking the huge contribution aviation has to society. Uh, 
This is a rather old chestnut in terms of um, graphical representation, but we know towards 2050 that we need to break that trend and we need to do this with technology, but not technology only. We need to do this with sustainable uh, low carbon or preferably zero carbon fuels, but again, not only. It is the total mix, if you like, and the systemic approach, the system of systems approach, using new technology, enabling new fuels, getting the maximum benefit out of new architectures, and flying aircraft differently, different networks, di different operations, uh, that will bring us to the Air Transport Action Group's goal of 50% reduction compared to 1990, the EU goal of a climate neutral Europe by 2050, the European Green Deal is consistent with that, you could say slightly more ambitious, uh, but of course with the growth rates we have in Europe compared to areas in the world like China, the same technology, the same fuels will bring us closer to climate neutrality uh, than other areas. And as we kind of move, if you like, towards the area that we're going to be talking about briefly um, and, and then discussing with all of you, hydrogen. It has been said a number of times that hydrogen is, um, while an exciting high-risk, high-reward strategy, quote, unquote, unlikely to be a major factor in aviation. And I just like to reflect on that because even if we hear uh, you know, different metrics, different analysis coming from different organizations, um, there is a difference between measuring the European aviation system, the US system, uh, or the global system. And if you look at, this is ICCT uh, data from 2019. If you look at all of aviation uh, in terms of commercial flights worldwide, including domestic travel, it's rather surprising. What you see is that two thirds of emissions actually occur on flights below 2000 miles, roughly 4,000 kilometers. An analysis that we did with DLR uh, extending what you typically see in documents like the global market forecast of Airbus or the Boeing current market outlook, these 20 year forecasts, we've done some scenario planning towards 2050. And actually the short range up to 3000 kilometers seems to be an area where the growth will be higher than the long range growth. So to those who might feel that hydrogen is only likely to be a niche application, I think this data points to a very different story. And that's one of the reasons, but there's another one as well, why the Horizon Europe agenda proposing a clean aviation joint undertaking, a new partnership for the decade of the 20s, starting in 2021 and performing its technical activity uh, through the year 2030, 2031, is going to be focused very strongly on two things, uh, on the area, what, it, what I would call the window of opportunity, and on the breakthroughs that we can find. What I call the window of opportunity is where in the commercial marketplace, a clean sheet design, a new breed of aircraft can bring a really big step. And I think there's a strong consensus that that is um, going to be in the area of regional aircraft, short range aircraft, short medium range aircraft. A uh, very simple reason why, if you look at the state of the art in long range aircraft, the A350, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, the technology on board, the opportunity to make a 20, 30, or even higher percentage step there is just not here within grasp, if you like. Whereas if we're looking at short range, regional, short, medium range, I think there's a growing belief that between now and roughly mid 2030s, a really big step can be made. And hydrogen needs to be part of the analysis. We don't know where it will fit in terms of how far we can stretch this, but I don't think we can afford not to look at the option. And, uh, and I'm sure Glenn will expand if you like on that. As was mentioned, we did last year a very interesting analysis together with our colleagues in the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. Uh, and what you see here is a very quick and dirty analysis in terms of what climate impact can be achieved realistically in terms of the, um, the use of hydrogen as energy carrier on board. And I use energy carrier rather than fuel because the neat thing about hydrogen is that you can use it in combustion in a gas turbine, or you can use it in a fuel cell for electric propulsion, or you can even use both in hybrid variants. Uh, and what we see here, if you look at all of the contributors to warming potential, whether you use radiative forcing or accumulated temperature response, is that you see a very, very high potential for deep impact emerging from the hydrogen variants, either hydrogen burnt in a turbine, or I would say even more spectacular, the use of hydrogen in fuel cells. Now the practical implications of fuel cells 
are tricky in the sense of scaling and the ability to move uh, to move forward. It's likely that that's going to be for a considerable time limited to um, commuter regional aircraft, maybe the lower end of short range single aisle aircraft, uh, or of course augmenting the, the the power that you generate in a gas turbine. For what we typically would call the single aisle aircraft today, we believe the study tells us, if you like, that hydrogen is equally valid as an energy carrier, but more likely to be a fuel that's carried on board. Very likely to be liquid hydrogen because of the space constraints, which brings particular technical challenges to it. And what that means is that you start to look at a 2050 scenario, again, not a, an all out maximum fleet replacement, but a prudent replacement looking at where synthetic fuels, sustainable aviation fuels would continue to work best where they can work in harmony with hydrogen. So this is kind of a scenario where two fuels going forward are for several decades likely to be uh, important contributors to the decarbonization of aviation. Uh, starting from what I would call the lower end, commuters, regional, short range, and with the kind of fleet replacement scenarios that you could see from 2035, the kind of production rates that we think the market actually would like to see uh, in, in that area, actually up to 75% of the world's fleet could be replaced by 2050. And around 40% of the world's fleet could be hydrogen powered by then. Now it's going to be focused on the shorter end in terms of segments flight segments, uh, but its ability to make an impact in terms of the overall emissions profile of aviation is quite profound. You know, 1.8 gigatons of CO2 abated and another 0 0.8 in terms of equivalent CO2, if you like, in other species. You saw that in the earlier chart uh, because contrary to what people I think tend to believe, you know, you burn hydrogen, you get less CO2, obviously, no CO2, but a lot more water vapor. But the conditions under which you are burning hydrogen are very different in a turbine, uh, much cleaner, if you like. And the, um, the delta in terms of reduced contrails, also reduced NOx, actually mean that the net impact of hydrogen compared to synfuels uh, is, is a very, very, very different step of a different order and quite compelling. The final point I would say here is, you know, this is a pitch, if you like, for Europe's decade of hydrogen in research and innovation within aviation. But we'll only get there if we treat this as one of a multidimensional uh, challenge. We need to look at the infrastructure. We need to have the policies in place that will allow, uh, if you like, the, um, uh, the growth of the renewable energy base to allow hydrogen production to take place. We need to get hydrogen liquefied and at airports. Uh, we need a system of systems approach. Uh, and we need to pull together as an industry for that to happen. That's it from my side, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Ron. Very interesting. So I'll hand over to Glenn for the Airbus perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be with you to talk about a subject I'm extremely passionate and excited about and um, looking forward to, yeah, to, to sharing in a bit more detail. First of all, a bit more detail about why we're doing this. Uh, I think we have set ourselves an incredible challenge. Those of you who've looked at hydrogen, who've worked around hydrogen, uh, who work in the aviation industry will know that hydrogen is not something that we're that familiar with for commercial aviation. And, and so it's challenging. So why did we take this challenge on board? Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about that and then talk a little bit about what are some of the solutions that we're looking at and the concepts that we have revealed. Uh, I guess in, in very simple terms, what we can see and I think what we can all see is that societal and regulatory expectation is changing and at an extremely fast pace. We've seen a huge amount of development in the 2019 and 2020 period. We have been working on this project since about 2017, 2018, uh, and we expect the trend to continue into the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, uh, climate impact is a story that's absolutely not going to go away. And rather than survive in that context, Airbus, uh, at Airbus, we want to position ourselves to thrive in that context. We want to create products which have zero climate impact. And that's what the Zero E program is targeting. 
We've revealed these three concepts in September 2020. These concepts uh, are hybrid electric concepts. So it means that in all three concepts in front of you right now, we have um, hydrogen powering gas turbines. And in parallel, we are able to provide the gas turbines with electrical power in what's called a, a parallel hybrid configuration. That electrical power is coming for, from fuel cells because once you have hydrogen on board, it really makes sense to use fuel cells to create your electrical energy through a very efficient uh, process rather than to carry batteries on board. Uh, what you see from this chart is the immense versatility of hydrogen. So all the way from general aviation, which many of you perhaps have seen some activity in through to 100 seats, 200 seats, 1,000 nautical miles, 2,000 nautical miles, um, for, for sure, huge versatility in hydrogen, covering a large part of our market. And as Ron just mentioned, also covering a large part of the emissions of aviation. Um, hydrogen is, in, in our view, and we've studied basically every possible option um, that, that is available to us, butane, propane, methane, ammonia, uh, all of the different types of sustainable aviation fuels. Hydrogen is the um, holy grail in terms of its ability to disruptively reduce and potentially even eliminate aviation's climate impact. And that's why we're focused on hydrogen. I'll end my intro with a quick presentation of the fourth concept that we revealed in December last year. Uh, we call this the pod configuration. It's a, a configuration which uses 100% fuel cells. So in this concept, there are in fact no gas turbines. Um, and we are using this concept and some variants of this concept that, that concept that we've not made public to really understand the scalability uh, of fuel cells, both in terms of technical feasibility and commercial viability uh, to commercial aviation applications. Um, all of the concepts that I've just shared with you are part of the family of concepts that we're studying. We're due to make decisions in 2022, 2023 about which concept we finally uh, want to, to take to the next phase. We're developing technologies and we'll have flight demonstration up until 2025. And then uh, all being well in 2025, 2026, we'll be in a position to press the button on the aircraft development activities to achieve an entry into service by 2035. Um, I've spoken a bit about the technologies. I think it's really important to understand that the infrastructure and ecosystem is critical to the success in zero E. No infrastructure means no aircraft. I think there's going to be lots of momentum uh, through other sectors adoption of hydrogen. The trucking industry is going very fast in that direction. We're going to see hydrogen trucks on our roads in the 2020s, uh, but there will still be some effort from the aviation industry uh, energy providers and airports uh, in order to make it possible to refuel our zero E aircraft uh, at airports in the future. I think the, the point which you make in relation to the infrastructure, I think, is critical as well, which is uh, a very good introduction into Amelia to talk about uh, the airport's perspective. Amelia, Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, so our partners at Airbus and uh, CleanSky join the taking have taken have talked about um, how big is the challenge to bring the aircraft to the market in 15 years, and obviously our role as an airport is very different. Uh, but it is exactly what uh, we've last talked about: it's to make sure that the aircraft can fly to and from our airports, and not only obviously Paris airports, but also airports anywhere in the world because uh, the aircraft needs an origin and a, a destination. And uh, contrary to what we could think, it's actually not too early to start working on that and uh, start uh, tackling those issues uh, to make sure that the ground system is ready uh, to welcome the aircraft, the hydrogen powered aircraft. So we see four issues from our point of view, from the point of view of airports. 
The first one is obviously to make sure that there is um, an airport compatibility in the design of the aircraft. But actually, we're not that worried about that because we have a very successful, obviously, partnership with Airbus on those issues. And we, we, we will collectively make sure that the aircraft is compatible with the airports. Um, the other issues might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, obviously, it's to make sure that the infrastructure on the ground is ready, that we have the storage, liquefaction, supply, uh, distribution system of hydrogen at the airport and that we are ready uh, to um, have ground operations uh, in place for, for when the, the, the aircraft is at the airport. Then it is to make sure that we have the regulation in place also uh, that make it legally possible uh, to um, manipulate liquid hydrogen at airports and uh, that we can actually welcome the hydrogen plane uh, when, wherever in the world. And uh, while well, the last challenge, uh, which is the one that is linked to what you actually said in the introduction, is to make sure that we have a, a supply chain ready, which means that we have production in, uh, in quantity uh, that make it possible to have this, uh, this aircraft at a at large scale that is uh, largely developed and, um, and with a good penetration on the, on the airline's fleet. And actually, even on this, we think that we can start working now. And that's actually exactly what we've been doing um, in the past few months when we launched this call for interest, is that we think that the supply chain will be ready if we manage to have uh, enough use case of hydrogen at the airport so that there is a market and a sizable market that, that uh, is created around the airports. And that doesn't have to be exclusively through the use of hydrogen for aviation, but it can start with the use of hydrogen for trucks, for logistics, for other use cases, uh, even like a uh, light fleet of, uh, of vehicles. And this we can start working on now. And this is exactly what we are doing uh, with our partners in Paris area. Um, what we want to say with this action is that actually hydrogen from our point of view is not only a technical challenge, but it's also an economic challenge and a political challenge. And that's very important for us. And that's probably where our value added is as an airport, is to make sure that uh, the, the economic viability of the hydrogen plane is there too, because we make hydrogen um, available in sufficient quantity for av aviation. So this is exactly uh, what we are working on now. And also obviously the political challenge, which is uh, to make sure that the local population, local community that live nearby the airport are also willing to have hydrogen and liquid hydrogen um, stored uh, in the airport. And that's, that's not that easy either. And we need to work also on better understanding uh, the impact of hydrogen uh, and well, how useful it can be. And then obviously what's been said about the impact on climate is very essential in this perspective. So we are working on those issues now. And obviously this means, um, well, starting now with uses that are use cases that are not directly for hydrogen power plane, but that contribute to making it a reality in the future and in 15 years. We also think that there is a strong link between hydrogen power plane and uh, sustainable aviation fuel because obviously there will be competition for resources for sustainable aviation fuel. And we think that synthetic fuels uh, will be part of the path towards sustainable aviation. And obviously synthetic fuels, um, well, they require hydrogen uh, to be produced. So obviously if we make sure that hydrogen has an economic viability and is available for aviation at a price that is correct, then this will help starting very soon uh, hydrogen hydrogen-based synthetic fuel to be produced and to be used in aviation. So that's why we think that actually working on those issues, working on the ground infrastructure, working on the economic viability of hydrogen is also something that is key to make a hydrogen power plane a success and that it starts now contrary to what we could uh, think. Okay, thank you, Amelia. That's very good. So, um... Can I start with the, uh, and there's a couple of questions actually coming in, just touching on the last point, which is around supply and the economics. So in general, aviation will be part of an ecosystem, pardon the pun, that's actually trying to source hydrogen. And so there are production issues in terms of, can we get the, a critical supply of hydrogen? And uh, what, what is it we need to do in order to make that 
supply economically attractive enough to be to use. So maybe I'll start with with Ron from a policy point of view and we can go around the table. Ron. That, that's a good question, and it's and it's a little bit of a tricky question. But I think we have to, uh, you know, we have to address uh, to a certain extent the elephant in the room. I think I, I think the, you know, one one of the really uh, compelling issues here is how hydrogen, the primary element in the universe, if you like, is is uh, you know we often say in aviation there's no silver bullet towards decarbonizing, but but hydrogen does seem to be a kind of a golden key because. If we're going towards sin fuels, we're going to need hydrogen. Uh, uh, if we're going to use hydrogen, obviously we need hydrogen. It, the energy resources required, this is probably one of our bigger challenges, the level of renewable energy that will be required for hydrogen production. Or, you know, if you'll permit me to use something which in some circles is considered a taboo, I think you know, the nuclear option is going to be back on the table. But, okay. but not non-carbon producing energy sources on ground for the creation of the hydrogen demand that will, that will grow. There's no doubt the demand will grow. Meeting that growth uh, is, 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 is going to be a challenge. I think aviation has a very compelling story to tell and why, you know, why we would be a prime user. Okay, very good. Glenn, what's your perspective on that? I think we will be a relatively small user of hydrogen. Um, if we do an analysis of uh, various industries and what it takes for them to decarbonize and eliminate their climate impact, uh, hydrogen is going to be part of the future world that we all want to get to. We all want to get to the Paris Agreement. We all want to eliminate our climate impact. And, and other industries are in fact going to be much bigger users of hydrogen than aviation is. And that is going to have a massive effect in uh, bringing down the cost, which is hugely important in making climate neutral flying uh, a reality. And it's also going to have an effect in making um, uh, availability of, of hydrogen just much more uh, ubiquitous, I think. Uh, f you know, fossil fuels today are ubiquitous. They're basically everywhere. You turn a corner and there are fossil fuels. In the 2030s, in the 2040s, something's got to replace that. And yeah. I think hydrogen is going to be a big part of what replaces that. And this scale effect is going to have a phenomenal impact on cost. So, Amelia, then, from an airport's point of view, it must be a tricky business case then in terms of the, the, this joint venture in terms of not having economic certainty, shall we say, about what model is going to be in the future. How, how, how do ADP uh, deal with that issue, I suppose? Well, it's a major issue for all of us, I think, as, uh, as Glenn and Ron have said. And uh, obviously, it's, it's an issue for the whole economy because the whole economy will need to switch to renewable energy and produce hydrogen more massively. And this will obviously have an impact on the cost of energy, even though we need to bring that down uh, too. And uh, I think that what we can do on that is actually what we are starting to do now is try to give early signal uh, as much as possible and to make sure that investment and uh, finance is, is directed toward this and trying to bring uh, the, the production up as much as possible. And obviously we also need strong policy support and I think that's what the government are doing as well, but it is very important. And the earlier we try to uh, make the switch and try to give the right signal, um, then it's easier to bring the, the prediction at the level where we need it, where we need it to bring down the cost. But obviously there will be a massive uh, impact on the economy of having a, a global switch toward renewable energy in the next 15 years. And I think that's an issue that, uh, that is uh, above the issue of only aviation sector. Okay, so given, given the issue in terms of aviation's perception socially um, in terms of sustainability, uh, how do you see the transition, and this is to all the panelists, how do you see the transition working from where we are now to 2035, given that we have to, we have to do stuff immediately? And, and how, how do we sell that blended message in terms of you know, sustainable fuels versus hydrogen, et cetera? How, 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 how do, we make that, do we make that message? 
So, Ron, maybe yourself, you want to kick off from a. I, I, you, you, you kind of lost me a little bit there, but I, if, I, if I understood the, the point well, Philip, uh, correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong, your, 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 your question was um, you know, how do we get sufficient progress early in the game, if you like, towards yes, the 2030 yeah. target in the European Green Deal versus 2050? Right. Yeah, that's uh, and of course, a, a storyline which is not easy to tell. But we in the aviation industry need to. Um, you know, I, I think we also need to own up to the fact that we're a long cycle industry with, uh, you know, with a, with a with a with a fantastic safety record, uh, yeah. and and a, and a very, some very good reasons why we want to maintain that. But uh, you know, with with a journey towards a new fleet of aircraft, which doesn't happen at the same speed as automotive or uh, or mobile phones uh, in that sense. Uh, it, what it boils down to is I think the fleet replacement with the current generation of new aircraft coming off uh, off the line is already a big step compared to the installed base. Moving towards sustainable fuels as we know them right now and aggressively moving towards the 30s in that direction is a very crucial element. Yeah. Uh, but I think between 2035 and 2050, that's where aviation can make the biggest, uh, you know, the, the, the profound and the deep change. Uh, but again, you know, at the same time, we're currently something like three to four percent of, of, of overall climate change in terms of as, as a sector. The thing is, when we look towards 2040, 2050, aviation is going to be a much bigger share of anthropogenic climate change uh, if we don't take these, uh, th these, these measures now. So you know, we can af afford, if you like, to be um, that three percent, but we cannot afford to be 30, 40, 50 percent of the carbon budget in the, tw in the 2040s. Okay. Glenn, what's your view on that? We, we produce aircraft. Um, we, we already have a, all our Airbus fleet in service that can carry up to 50% sustainable aviation fuel. We are not using the potential of those products. We need to get more sustainable aviation fuel on board those aircraft. Uh, we definitely uh, need to see that happening in the coming years. Um, it's it's just it's it's a real shame that uh, that we have not got the policies in place, the incentives in place to allow that to happen at the scale we need, and that definitely has to change over the next few years. Um, they they are complementary to what we're doing on the hydrogen side. Uh, you you saw the charts I, I shared earlier where we're talking about. 1,000, 2,000 nautical miles. This means in the first generation of hydrogen technology, we're not talking about long range aircraft. It means we need sustainable aviation fuel for those long range aircraft. So this is complementary um, hydrogen and sustainable aviation fuels. And as Emily mentioned, you know, hydrogen is even an ingredient for, for synthetic fuel for, for um, one of the key most scalable aviation, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So really, there's huge complementarity and we need the incentives, the um, uh, ecosystem in place to, to push sustainable aviation fuel over the coming years. Okay. So, Amelia, I suppose from an infrastructure point of view, you then have to have a number of different types of uh, both sustainable fuel and hydrogen on tap. How, how does the... How do the airports... Uh, how, how can you plan for that in the absence of a clear incentive program, as Glenn mentioned, in order to, to, to plan for that? Well, actually, um, I think it's not possible without a strong policy uh, signal. And I think that's something that we need now. And that's quite clear. Um, as you said, and as uh, our partner said, sustainable aviation fuel are now uh, the key factor in order to bring down uh, emissions in the coming years. Even though um, I must say that I'm quite thankful because the, the airlines have maintained their program for fleet renewal, even though it's a big crisis for them right now. And they haven't uh, brought down their, their ambition in terms of fleet renewal. And I think that's something that we can uh, see, well, that we can mention. But obviously, a sustainable aviation fuel is the path towards uh, bringing down uh, the emissions in the next few years. And we need now a strong policy framework uh, in order to make sure that the production of SAF and, uh, of course, uh, the well, um, 
the, the offtake by the airlines uh, comes into reality and that, that needs uh, now clarification in the, in the very uh, coming weeks and months. Um, so I think we are ready, obviously, at the airport. We are ready to welcome SAF because SAF is a dropping uh, fuel. So it can be, as uh, Glenn said, it can be um, well mixed uh, in the in the current uh, aircraft, and so obviously it can be mixed also in our supply system, in our storage and supply system at the airport. So we are ready uh, to welcome the SAF at the airport. We are working uh, towards making it possible to have hydrogen as soon as the aircraft is ready and whenever it is ready, it will be able to fly to and from our airports. Now, what we need is for the production uh, to take up and for and the well for the, the the airlines to be in the capacity to buy it. So obviously, what we need now is the policy framework. Okay, I think that's clear. Um, on on a more technical level, then. Uh, Glenn, to go back to your presentation, can you talk to me a little bit about non-CO2 emissions and the role which that has in the overall environmental climate impact assessment um, uh, and um, how what work is going on at the moment to try and develop that a little bit further? Yeah, so maybe I'll caveat some of what I'm saying by first saying that I'm not a climate scientist and uh, Airbus is not a climate science organization. Um, but what we do see from uh, climate scientists and, and people who study this in detail is that uh, aviation has a climate impact beyond CO2. NOx and uh, persistent contrails look like they have a climate impact increasing the, the total climate impact beyond what purely CO2 does. And, you know, we're, we're, interested in the science, we're interested in understanding the science better, uh, uh, we're interested in also developing the solutions which respond to uh, that statement. So what it, what it means for us, particularly around hydrogen, is that um, hydrogen is, and I mentioned this earlier, the, the solution which allows us to have the most significant reduction in the climate impact. We're not just dealing with CO2 when we uh, consider hydrogen and all of the options in front of us. So when we look at NOx, when we look at uh, persistent contrails, hydrogen looks like it has the most potential compared to every other option uh, to significantly reduce and potentially eliminate those non-CO2 effects. The CO2 effect once the hydrogen is produced from uh, renewable energy is already um, a non-issue. Now, of course, we have to make sure that we uh, increase the amount of renewable energy and the, the amount of hydrogen supply uh, available, renewable hydrogen supply available. Uh, but uh, given that, we see certainly hydrogen as having massive potential. We're not going to satisfy ourselves with the, the work that's been done so far on that. You're going to see flight testing and demonstration, which uh, convinces us that, in, in fact, what, what we have out of the exhaust of these aircraft is, in fact, what the theory uh, is telling us. And that's a big part of our program up until 2025. Uh, and uh, hopefully with confirmation of, of the theory, we'll then be in a strong position to take this technology to, to market. Okay. Ron, I presume that looking at your presentation, you'd agree with that analysis um, in terms of non-CO2, in terms of uh, impact, et cetera? There, there's a lot more that could be said, but I, I think in the interest of time, the yes is the, is, is, the, is the short answer. Okay, great. So can I, can I touch on um, uh, a point, Amelia, which you raised, which is the social piece, particularly at airports. I, if, um, I think there's a kind of a public acceptability issue around hydrogen. And you mentioned the, the issue in neighborhoods where the acceptability to people about having hydrogen stored um, at, at an airport and whether that would raise concerns or not. I presume that in some way you have to you have to integrate it into the local economy so that it becomes part of their, their the value and they can see the value to that. How, how do ADP, how is that engagement going on and, and how do you think uh, you could manage those concerns? 
Well, um, actually, ADP has a strong history of, um, of exchanging and being very integrated with the local community. Uh, obviously, it has a lot of challenge, but uh, we, we do have a, a relationship that is, um, that is existing and we talk together about many issues. And this is uh, something new that we need to discuss with them. And obviously, as you said, um, while the, the main factor is also showing and trying to identify with them where hydrogen can, can be of help for them, I mean, what can they do with hydrogen? And obviously, we do believe that given the fact that hydrogen is a solution also uh, that has a lot of um, possible use cases uh, in terms of, uh, well, mobility first, uh, obviously. And mobility is a huge, huge uh, issue, especially where we are uh, set, which is uh, next to Paris, but not in Paris and in the, in the suburb where there are a lot of uh, mobility issues. Uh, well, then obviously it's a solution for them on those issues. We also have strong, a uh, big logistic platform around the airport and that can be of use uh, for them. And, and, and then obviously there is a, uh, other use cases possible of hydrogen when it's for industrial heat or, or, or power. Um, so, so we do believe that our main work now is trying to identify with local communities where hydrogen can be of use for them and show that what we can do is try to build an ecosystem for hydrogen with sufficient um, well, supply and storage capacity so that they can use and then it can also be used for then the, the aviation fleet. And I think that's how we can tackle this issue by showing them that it's not supporting a risk for us, but it's having together something that is an opportunity for the decarbonization of the, of the economy around airports and in a in very dense uh, suburban area. So okay. that's what we are working on with them. And as, uh, as uh, I said earlier, it's, it's an issue for now, even though the plane is in 15 years, that's actually something that we are discussing with them now. Okay, so Ron, or yeah, Ron, can I go back to the policy issues? I mean, given that aviation has such a bad reputation, shall we say, at the moment. What do we need to do as an industry collectively to influence policy to change the perception in relation to aviation at a European policy level? Uh, what do we need to do collectively in order to, to change, the, change the discussion and, and shift it so that we do get the economic incentives and policies which we require to do this? That's a tough question, and I'm not sure I really have the, let's say, a mandate to speak on that, uh, other than feeling, you know, that I too am a European citizen, and I, sure, and, yeah. and, 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 and by the way, somebody who's passionate with respect to aviation. I think, I yeah. think, you know, we, we can we can show a phenomenal track record in increasing the, let's say, the safety track record, the operational reliability, the uh, the cost effectiveness, the affordability of avi of aviation, and of course, its efficiency. Uh, so the economic value of aviation, I think, you know, can be restated and, re and restated uh, frequently over. What we're dealing with, I think, is a different level of realization in terms of, um, you know, uh, society's realization with respect to climate change. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I think we need to keep pushing in where we're going. The topic we're talking about today uh, you know, is an Apollo project size challenge. It's nothing short of a man on the moon type. Yeah. President von der Leyen likes to mention this in terms of climate neutrality, but I think we have our own little man on the moon challenge here in terms of aviation and such a game changer as, as hydrogen. Uh, and, I, and I think we should use this to our advantage in terms of saying, you know, we know where we could go if you come with us. Okay. Because it will take public policy. It will take uh, you know, very substantial funding, which by the way, in terms of a percentage of GDP or even a percentage of, um, of the annual tourism-related uh, uh, economic benefits in Europe, it's quite modest. Mm. The thing but that strikes, to, yeah. yeah, sorry. The thing that strikes me though is that the communication within the industry is very fragmented. We don't have a theme. We don't have a high kind of ideal of which we're we're putting it together. Because when you put the when you put you three players together, you can see the value chain and the infrastructure piece. The bit I don't see at a societal level is how we should organize ourselves as an industry to try and push that um, in terms of driving the political agenda, because that's ultimately what's going to give you the policy. I think maybe just to, to step in, um, yeah. the, the 
I think the, the EU has set out its stall and explained very clearly uh, the ambition um, in, inside Europe, yeah. uh, contributing to a global ambition. I think we have a, a huge opportunity with the um, changing uh, ecosystem outside of Europe to bring more players with us in the same sort of direction. It's going to be really important for us as aircraft manufacturers to have a global system that's evolving. I think the US and Europe can take now a joint leadership on that and we can hopefully start to see um, significant alignment in terms of the policy measures, the long-term planning that's going to have to be put in place to, to allow uh, people like us make the massive investment decisions that are going to be required for, for it to be successful. And, you know, I, I'm speaking, I guess, on behalf of an aircraft manufacturer, but the, the truck manufacturers, the ship manufacturers, the um, energy sector, everybody needs to see the same thing that, that we do. Many companies are now global players. So whatever we can do in terms of aligning globally is going to be really uh, important. And I think Europe as a, 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 a huge, powerful player and, and a, a leader in this area, I think has an important role to play in um, taking this topic to the world stage and influencing what happens uh, elsewhere. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, in terms of regulation, we have a couple of questions coming through in terms of regulation. So Glenn, while you have the floor there, what do you think the regulatory challenges will be um, from, from a hydrogen aircraft, obviously, point of view, in terms of what do you see that, that needs to be put in place to, and what are the regulatory challenges for you? So, so it's, it's from the simplest thing, like uh, standardizing how to refuel uh, an aircraft with hydrogen. Um, you know, no, none of that is available today. It's not even available today in the truck industry, and they're pushing extremely hard on a much uh, tighter uh, schedule than, than what we are to, to standardize interfaces and uh, uh, technologies between sometimes different industries to allow the refueling of, of these aircraft. So that kind of regulation and standardization activity is going to be really important across the whole industry and sometimes across several industries. Um, in terms of uh, the, the ecosystem, we're going to need uh, regulation which encourages hydrogen to be developed at scale, which therefore brings hydrogen cost down. Um, and coming back to what we were talking about on sustainable aviation fuel, we, we need sustainable aviation fuel to be used more widely um, because um, as, as it becomes used, used more widely, we're going to see hydrogen uh, being used more widely because it's an ingredient of synthetic fuel that's going to scale hydrogen and it's going to make uh, hydrogen aircraft competitive as as it because it will have to compete with um, sustainable aviation fuel if if we have to compete with kerosene at today's prices that probably will be more difficult but if we can increase the amount of sustainable aviation fuel used hydrogen aircraft will for sure be competitive okay and Amelia, at, uh, from a regulatory point of view at the airports, I presume that that's also, I think you mentioned as one of your four key challenges that uh, you also need to address. Well, yes, obviously we have uh, issues of uh, security at our infrastructure and for staff working around the hydrogen planes. And uh, obviously also, uh, well, firefighting, which is uh, an activity at the airport. And we need to have, uh, uh, well, the, the regulation in place for this. We are not worried that it's not possible. We just need uh, to set the regulation and st set the standard. We need to agree across the industry and I think that's where the challenge is. And obviously, as Glenn said, uh, the aviation industry needs a lot of standards uh, because, um, well, a pilot and, and its aircraft need to have the same or basic same treatment at the, at the airport where this, they are originating and where they are going to, um, so that not everything is different and that the treatment on the ground is standardized. And I think that's what we need to work on also. And that's why we need to bring those issues at the, at the global level and at the international organization for the civil aviation. 
So obviously we have a lot of work to do on regulation and norms, but we are not um, well too worried and uh, it just needs time. It needs time to make everyone uh, agree on those uh, standards and, and regulation. And obviously the economic regulation is another uh, issue. It's, it's, it's a full issue, but as we said already, and as Glenn said, I think it's an issue that needs to first be tackled be tackled through SAF. And, uh, and I think that to go back to your previous question, I think that a more massive use of SAF is actually what will uh, make uh, the civil society understand that aviation has started its transition and, um, and help uh, well enhance the image in the, in the public view, in the public eye. But it really needs to go uh, from having um, a more massive use of SAF in the, in the very next few years. Okay. Uh, we've got some other questions here from ANSPs, mostly wanting to know uh, what the impact of hydrogen fuel aircraft would be on air traffic management. Would it? Uh, I know that the profile of some of the aircraft may change, and I've seen reports where the uh, the speed of aircraft might be reduced. Um, Ron, maybe you take that one to see what the, what potentially might be the impact. Yeah, I, I would turn it around. I think actually, you know, there there are some areas where you could um, build back better. Uh, to to use something that that at times maybe sounds a little bit cliche, and you know, where where we could uh, you know, redesign the air transport system in terms of where the sweet spots are, types of aircraft. You know, we we have, we we tend we seem to have um, you know uh, evolved into an air transport system with a relatively small percentage of regional aircraft and then a very large number of single aisle aircraft, which are incredibly flexible uh, and and uh, and you know the the workhorses for airlines and then long you know, twin aisle long range twins. Uh, but you look at the distribution of flights and you see, as, as I tried to show you, a, a very substantial amount of flights are relatively short range, where, you know, Frankfurt, London, block times for Frankfurt, London, I think now are longer than they were when Lufthansa were flying with super constellations. Okay. Uh, so you can imagine that there are areas where a different uh, optimum could evolve, uh, but that won't be as a consequence of hydrogen. Hydrogen will follow the aircraft design. So if there's a business case for a short range aircraft with uh, a lower uh, lo a lower cruise speed because the market is there. Then I think you would ad adapt the, if you like the the propulsion system to it. But as the concepts that that Glenn were, was showing, uh, you know, they range very widely from uh, potentially even a non tube and wing blended wing body all the way down, if you like, to a, a propeller uh, regional type aircraft. So I don't think hydrogen drives the, the the cruise speed or the cruise altitude, but it can follow where the optimum of the aircraft is. And that in itself is an interesting question because I think the the way we have evolved currently, uh, I I for one wouldn't assume that the optimum in 2050 is going to be precisely the same as it is now. There are a lot of economics come into play. How airlines like flexibility, how le lease leasing companies require flexibility in their in their fleets, etc. Okay. So Glenn, in terms then of the uh, the, the the airline model, your customers. Uh, based on these uh, new configurations of aircraft, how do you think that will affect their the airline business model? Will it will it lead to a push back towards a hub and spoke model? Do you think rather than city pairs, or uh, what's Airbus's analysis of how the market will evolve? I guess we could see two effects. Um, the first one is. Uh, we've seen airlines differentiate on the basis of cost over the last decades. Uh, will, in the future, airlines wish to differentiate on the basis of uh, climate impact in, in the future? And will that encourage uh, some players to be only zero E aircraft operators in, in the future? I think that's, that's something which, which could happen, which we could see moving forward. Um, I think certainly in the transition, so, you know, we're not going to have uh, hydrogen at every airport from 2035, which is the first uh, entry into service date. So in the transition, we're going to see uh, a model of deployment, which is going to be uh, very much hub and spoke uh, oriented, where, for example, you have a hub kitted out with all of the infrastructure for refueling, but your aircraft is sized to be able to do out and back uh, trips uh, which are of interesting distance to, to make the whole solution commercially viable. 
And because hydrogen in itself is very low weight, um, there's very low cost to tankering hydrogen in that case. And because it's zero emissions, there's, there's no debate. So certainly in the transition period, you could see a model of, of hub and spoke. But over the longer term, I think we'll see um, the system evolving to being exactly the same kind of system as, as what we have today. Okay. Emilia, would you agree with that, given that you're the guys making the investment in the infrastructure on the ground? Um, I presume you won't be, if you have lots of airports, you won't be putting them at all the airports if you can avoid it. Would, uh, what's your view on that? Well, obviously, it's um, a little bit too early to answer, but uh, our view is that uh, we need to understand better um, well, how the hydrogen-powered aircraft will um, enter into the fleet of, uh, of airlines and then decide our investment based on that. But our goal would obviously be that all our airports uh, can welcome the hydrogen-powered aircraft uh, since we do believe indeed that um, from now on the, the differentiation between both airlines and airports uh, will be uh, more and more based on the environmental performance and that's uh, a global trend in the economy. So we want to be obviously uh, where, where we are expected in terms of transition. And uh, we do believe that our client airlines will also want and it will be a criteria for them uh, that they can have their zero emission aircraft to be welcome at our airport. Otherwise, they, will, they might want to go somewhere else where it's possible. Uh, so obviously, we want to be able to welcome those in all our airports, but we need to better understand how uh, airlines will adopt. And obviously, this is also um, how we can work together uh, collectively to make it more available at a, at a cheaper price so that more and more airlines are, are committing uh, to adopt the, the zero emission aircraft. Okay. Uh, we have a number of questions here about hydrogen versus battery-powered uh, aircraft. I think, um, I think actually, Ron, you touched on this in your presentation. Could you expand a little bit about, I think you were talking about that they were complementary rather than uh, competitive, but maybe you might just expand a little bit on that, please. Yeah, I think I think in the, the the part of the presentation was more about the complementarity of of, of sustainable fuels or syn fuel versus yeah. uh, versus hydrogen, uh, and I think and, and Glenn also uh, I think reinforced that uh, that that notion. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of activity and even uh, you know billions of private equity going into uh, into aviation, maybe in a little bit of a blind spot compared to this discussion, the urban air mobility or the private, uh, let's say uh, on demand air, uh, air, air travel, which is a new phenomenon. I, I think it's a phenomenon that is going to compete with, uh, with light rail and with limousines mm -hmm. and with cars more than with mainstream aviation as we, as we now know it. Um, you know, I, I think, and Glenn can certainly speak to that with some of the research that was, has been done inter alia in Clean Sky 2, but also elsewhere in terms of battery based hybrids. Uh, you know, there's a good rationale there for helicopters, um, you know, general aviation, six seat, eight seat, nine seat, maybe up to, up to, up to commuter size. When you look at a, at a, at a let's say, a realistic amount of battery De derived energy on board a single aisle aircraft. You know, the performance of batteries is nowhere near where it needs to be, but also doesn't seem to be trending within the next decade or two in that direction. Now, of course, we don't know what we don't know in terms of battery chemistries, but it, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, I think we, personal, personal reflection, I think we'll see battery based hybrids uh, very much evolving around the commuter and general aviation side. And uh, you know, once you're at, at, at the higher end of commuter and interregional aircraft, the fuel cell potential is, is currently seems much more promising than, uh, than batteries. And if you're at single aisle level, you're talking about burning hydrogen as a, as a fuel rather than using it in a fuel cell. Okay, Glenn, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, may, maybe just the most interesting sort of numbers to compare hydrogen to batteries is, um, uh, hydrogen has 33,000 watt hours per kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, kerosene is about 12,000 watt hours per kilogram. So that's a measure of energy per kilogram. And the best certified batteries are in between 100 and 200 watt hours per kilogram. So you're talking about 200 times less energy per kilogram. And for aviation, 
kilograms are really important, um, which for the large aircraft certainly rules out batteries, at least in the um, horizon of our ambition. Um, if we were talking about 2050 uh, plus, then maybe batteries would reappear. But if we're talking about bringing zero emission aircraft to reality by 2035, uh, we think hydrogen is going to be much more promising. Okay. Can I just ask you briefly, there's a couple of questions here in relation to new entrants and UAVs, another great imponderable about when it, when it happens. Do you think that drones and UAVs will accelerate the take up of hydrogen or do you think it will have any significant impact in the market? I think there's place probably in the UAV space for both where you want uh, high endurance capability, uh, very short refuel times, maybe uh, hydrogen is a better solution. Um, but when you're talking about uh, short uh, missions um, and maybe extremely simple uh, infrastructure, you know, some, some battery powered drones, you could, you could have it in a very remote location, charge it with solar panels, you don't need anything else and you can operate um, your system like that. So, so I think really it depends on, on the application and there's probably space for both. Ron, do you have any view in relation to drones? Will they make any impact or is it a uh, maybe just the, Yeah, maybe just a reflection that if you're looking at the current air, air transport system, anything below a 50 seat regional aircraft, you're in the 1% of fuel burnt category. 99% of fuel burnt is at regional aircraft or, or larger. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't take into consideration the extent to which personal air mobility or drones might, you know, might shift dramatically the number of aircraft and the number of movements, etc. But I, I still would be very surprised if the if the overall energy ba balance in the air air transport regime, uh, you know, shifted more than one or two percent towards the lower end. So I think uh, it, it might help in terms of there being a a, a better business case for having hydrogen. Uh, on location, uh, but I don't think the the total demand for hydrogen is going to be driven by by urban air mobility or by drones. Okay, so I think that goes back to the point you made, Amelia, about if you created SAF, uh, sorry, a hydrogen infrastructure close to the airport, then you could tap into a broader constituency than purely aviation, like buses and trucks and stuff like that. And is that I suppose we probably need to think of it in a broader sense in order to to give it the kind of economies of scale that, that are really important. Yes, uh, obviously we need to take that in the larger sense. And uh, well, the good thing about hydrogen is that it can have so many uses with the same uh, molecule that uh, obviously it helps us uh, making possible a, a larger market. Uh, but yes, we need to, to look at, um, well, mobility, ground mobility is a large market. There, there are so many vehicles on the road uh, every year that obviously um, there is potential there um, to, to bring up the market. Well, aviation and production of staff is another market. And obviously we need to make that, uh, well, a reality as well. And then obviously industrial, uh, industrial power. So, well, I would say that uh, urban air mobility is part of that as, as a part of a, of a bigger uh, issue. And uh, we are actually uh, very interested in urban air mobility um, at uh, ADP because obviously, uh, well, very short uh, mobility like that need to be, uh, in order to be accepted even more uh, exemplary, not only in terms of emissions, but also, I mean, not only CO2 emissions, but also uh, local pollution and also noise. And I think uh, this kind of mobility, if it wants to um, exist in the future, needs to be, uh, well, a no impact at all uh, mobility. Uh, so obviously we need to work on that. We need to uh, well, make a, a, a new kind of, uh, of urban mobility uh, appear. And we are uh, definitely working on that because we also have well, um, smaller uh, airports uh, in the Paris area uh, that are focused on very, very uh, short uh, and local mobility. And this is uh, the, well, the easy playground for this kind of mobility. So I, I would not say either that it will be uh, the major uh, impact on the market that the urban air mobility switches to hydrogen or electricity, but it's part of the bigger transition 
And I think that uh, we need to make sure that it also happens in order to, to be able to have a, this, uh, this opportunity also um, happen in our, in our regions, yes. And I suppose it probably, it, it also moves towards the complementarity of the different transport parts where one of the things I kind of sense in Europe is there's a kind of a competition between trains, airplanes, you know, trucks and so on. Whereas in fact, I think there's an issue around how that can all be worked together in a more coherent way in order to, be, to deliver a better solution. And like you say, it might be different in a regional airport than it would be in a major airport. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, our view is that all this kind of mobility is complementary. Um, well, we we are talking a lot about indeed the competition be between train and aviation, but our conviction is that train and aviation are not used for the same segments and the same uh, kind of uh, of move of movement. Um, so we are working in order to improve uh, the connection between train and planes. But we do not see a big switch from planes to trains only because it's not the same kind of use. And so we do believe that all these kind of, um, of uh, well, mobility uh, are, are, are complementary uh, and need to, to make sure that they, that they all can develop and they all uh, go towards a, a zero impact. Then the fact is that uh, while our major impact Airports are in France, and in France, the electricity is decarbonized uh, due to the nuclear power, obviously. So the train is al is already decarbonized. Um, so it's it makes it not the best candidate for development of hydrogen. It can be the case in other countries in Europe or in the world, um, but in France, it's not uh, the train that will be uh, the biggest or shortest term uh, candidate for hydrogen because it already has a rich a very, very uh, low uh, carbon impact due to nuclear power. Okay. So we are working on that, but obviously uh, the switch from for train from, uh, well, traditional electricity uh, to, to hydrogen is, is a bigger issue in other countries. Very good. So I'm just conscious we're coming to the end of the, uh, the webinar, which has been fascinating and we've lots of questions. Uh, can I ask each of you just in a minute to summarize what the key ask you would like to see in order to get hydrogen? What, what would you like to see uh, either from a policy point of view, a technical point of view to happen as a key enabler to bring hydrogen forward as a solution? Maybe we start with Ron. How about you? Well, I, I, I think I returned to a point where I at one point said, said there was a bit of an elephant in the room, uh, notwithstanding, I think Glenn's very, very, uh, very good point in terms of where, you know, where hydrogen will fit in every sector of society as we, as we you know, go to a, let's say, or aspire to go to a climate neutral world. But I think the, the two things I would say in short are, you know, we've lost the plot if we're if we're assuming that this is hydrogen that come from that can come from any source. If the hydrogen comes from coal-fired plants, then you know we're we're doing more damage than good. So we are making an assumption here that we're using green hydrogen, or worst case, we're make, we're using what's often called blue hydrogen, uh, right. meaning creating hydrogen but able to capture all of the CO2 ground-based and uh, and store it rather than have it have it leak. Uh, and we and 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 we of course. I think should not forget that the overall life cycle, so the, 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 the let's say the well to tank as well as the tank to wake uh, impacts are ultimately going to be the test of whether we're, whether we're doing this. But you know, you look at how solar, how wind are progressing. Uh, I'm an optimist in technology terms. If you look at what the near term uh, opportunities might be for for again for, for for nuclear options, I think there are pathways towards a very exponential growth in terms of in carbon-free energy production, electricity production, and then we open the door to hydrogen. Okay, Glenn. I think it boils down to two simple things. One, help us develop the technology, and two, help us develop the ecosystem in terms of uh, renewable hydrogen and, in, and infrastructure. Okay. And if we can do all that, we can, we can do this. I think everybody's motivated everybody wants to achieve the paris agreement everybody wants to get to climate neutrality but we have to work together we have to align industrial players public sector private sector and then we can do it okay amelia well uh, i agree with uh, what ron and glenn said and i think they are the key enablers 
And just in order to complete, and even though I've already been quite insistent on that, I think that um, the other thing that we need is a strong support, financial financial support of, for staff. And for two reasons. The first one is that the industry needs to um, keep the license to grow and the license to grow and the license to invest and keep the margins to be able to invest in the transition. We can only have that if we start the transition now. If we don't start the transition now, well, the activity will decline, the margins will decline and our ability to invest in a transition will decline. And so starting the transition means starting using SAF now. And the second reason is that synthetic fuel can bring up the market for hydrogen. And I think that the reason uh, why helping the SAF and helping the synthetic fuel can be the key enabler, um, well, in completion to, to what Glenn and Ron have said in order to make the hydrogen power plant a reality. Okay, thank you very much. So that, I suppose, to, to kind of summarize the kind of the key things I take away from this is, first of all, the point Amelia made about transition and also um, Ron's point about that we now need to start the work today because of the long lead times which we have in this industry. So therefore, we need to start yesterday. And if we invest in the technology, as, as Glenn said, it's potentially we can do this, uh, but we need to do it now. There is no point waiting for COVID-19 to be over and for the industry to recover because frankly, I think the lead times are too short. And that's my personal takeaway from this is that it's an urgent issue which we need to address almost straight away. So first, so at that we're coming to the end of, of the, uh, the webinar now, and it only remains for me, first of all, to thank my panel. It, it was a really interesting conversation. Um, thank you very much for your input. It, it was fascinating. And uh, we got lots of good feedback in terms of the, um, the questions and so on and so forth. And, and apologies that I couldn't get to all of them, but actually they were coming more quickly than they came. And actually what was happening was you were answering the questions as they were coming through on the chat. So again, apologies to... Uh, to the questions, but I think we managed to cover off most of the points which were there. So again, I just want to say thank you to our participants and panelists, and uh, just want to remind you that our next webinar is coming hot on the heels, which is one in relation to the air cargo industry, which is next week. And this actually is also looking at the only, the current only growth area in aviation, which is air cargo, which has so interestingly enough, quite a, a, a mature, shall we say, fleet. And that, uh, that also has sustainability challenges. So they have some unique challenges as well, which they need to meet. So that should be a very interesting um, uh, webinar. So we're looking forward to that. And I hope you'll all join me uh, next week. Anyway, it only remains again to say thanks to the panelists and to, uh, to, all, to thank all the participants who listened in today. And I just want to hope that you all stay safe, stay well, and stay optimistic. And hopefully we'll all meet physically uh, someday at a, at a conference or in a one-to-one -one rather than purely on webinars. But in the meantime, I wish you all well and thank you again for participating. Good evening.